All right. Thank you all so much for, for joining us today for the, the second panel on our Total Impact virtual series. Um, if you missed the first session on, on ESG and sustainable funds, you can check that out on our YouTube channel or um, on our website. Uh, while everyone is, is filtering in here, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our sponsors, including our, our lead sponsor for the series, InvestNet, um, along with additional sponsorship from Barclays and RBC Global Asset Management and Impact Assets. Um, I'd also like to mention our uh, network partner and, and longtime collaborator, Impact PHL. They, uh, they have a webinar tomorrow on um, ensuring that your company's 401k plan is, is aligned with your, your values. So that should be, that should be interesting. Um, one note before we get started, please feel free to submit any questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, as we get closer to the end of the hour, I will, uh, we'll do our best to, to get to as many of those questions as possible. Um, so with that, I would like to hand it over to our moderator today, William Burkhart, the president and co-founder of the Investment Integration Project, an applied research and consulting services firm that helps asset owners, managers, and advisors understand the the big picture or systemic context of their portfolio level decisions. He's also a fellow of the High Meadows Institute and he is the co-author of the upcoming book, 21st Century Investing, Redirecting Financial Strategies to Drive Systems Change, which will be published by Barrett Cole in 2021. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to you, Bill, to take it away. Thanks, Alex. And thanks for everybody for joining us for this session. So just as a kind of quick level set, um, over the next hour, as Alex implied, so building off the his kind of framing there, I'm going to provide a few remarks that kind of frame out uh, the discussion. We'll bring in these brilliant panelists that are just going to blow you away with all of their insights and knowledge. Then we'll come back for Q&A with the audience. Um, make sure we leave plenty of time at the end for that. Um, but folks, as Alex said, should be submitting questions in the meantime, and we'll try to get to them even uh, before we open it up. Um, and then we'll wrap up with a couple of final thoughts, kind of key action items, next steps from the panelists um, for people to kind of apply tomorrow in their practices. So just to um, kind of start us off, you know, at the end of the day, when we start to think about this kind of demand for sustainable and impact investing by, by clients, it's been intensifying. We've all experienced it. You open up the news every day. It seems to be growing in terms of interest and awareness. Um, and the pandemic has really served to turbocharge a lot of that. And think of the things that um, are kind of uh, filtering into your investors' heads right now. So the headlines over the past few months have been this kind of crazy, dizzying um, uh, set of them where highlighting everything from comparisons to the Great Depression, deepening racial disparities in health and opportunity, and increasingly uncertainty about what happens next. So in short, the COVID-19 pandemic has really reinforced what many investors were already coming to, right? That they need to integrate social and environmental considerations in their investment decision making, and they really need their advisors to support them in doing so. And a few years, or I guess it was a year and a half ago now, Brett, Noel, myself, and a few others partnered with Money Management Institute and a number of other industry bodies to come up with practical guidance for financial advisors as they attempt to kind of meet this need. And that's what we're really gonna focus on here today is kind of how a lot of that thinking is evolving in the face of the pandemic and the face of kind of growing data and information about the performance of these kinds of strategies and approaches and how that's changing um, client demand. I guess just to start us off though, that kind of key big prompt of why investors and why advisors should really start caring about this. Um, so I'll bomb through a couple of those and then we'll get right into the panel. So I think first big kind of key idea is that, you know, sustainable and impact investing, it's good for business. Um, people point to the kind of big number around one third or one fourth of assets under management are somehow aligned with these kinds of considerations. I think most advisors still grapple with, yeah, that's, at a high level, that seems to be true, but in reality, when they look at their portfolio or their practice, it's not really reflected in that way. One of the statistics that we do like to point to is that at least 84% or as much as 90% of millennial investors and nearly three-fourths of women are interested in sustainable investing. Given that two-thirds of adult children and 70% of women leave their family financial advisors after receiving an inheritance or after a spouse's death, considering sustainable or impact investing preferences might actually help curb such attrition. 
The other big key idea is that it can enhance per financial performance. This is something that we're going to return to in the panel discussion, but that sustainable companies can be better at managing risk and have less systemic volatility than their conventional peers, making them essentially overall better investments. And the third big idea is that environmental and social phenomena affect investors and vice versa. So sudden shocks to our financial and economic system, for example, with the financial crisis of 2008, the steady and persistent degradation of our environment, so with climate change, have essentially made the urgency and importance of confronting these systemic risks a lot clearer for investors. And yet again, this was all before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And there's different statistics out there that talk about how investors could experience losses of up to 45% if policymakers and private sector do not partner to mitigate climate change and limit global warming. And there's other studies that point to essentially social unrest caused by global youth unemployment and how it could produce significant volatility in financial markets. It's something that we saw during the Arab Spring a number of years ago, but something that we're increasingly starting to see as, as unemployment rates really tick up around the world. So the big overarching point to all of this is that when you start to think about the, the value or the leverage potential of impact or sustainable investing is that it essentially helps with client recruitment and retention. That's the big banner headline. And so this raises any number of sticky questions for advisors as they attempt to kind of meet that demand and, and really instigate that demand with their clients. And so we have an incredibly uh, powerful uh, set of perspectives here that help us kind of tease out a lot of these implications. Um, so Brett is obviously leading the impact investment charge at Investnet. Noel is kind of the impact investment guru at Morgan Stanley. And Lori is uh, fight, fighting a similar uh, battle uh, at, on the front lines with Veris uh, Wealth Management. So um, I want to start with, maybe we jump off with uh, Noel. Um, so talk to us a little bit about how 2020 has uh, how has 2020 confirmed or evolved your approach to investment management um, and really starting to meet client demand around impact considerations? Sure. Thanks, Bill. And thanks for having me on this panel. Um, I wouldn't put myself out as an impact investing guru, but I'm definitely an enthusiast. Um, so we've been kind of beating the drum about values integration for some time. We renamed our team the Conscious Wealth Management Group to call out specifically to our clients and our community that this level of consciousness is a part of our embedded process and what you can come to expect of us when you have a conversation and work with us. So um, even before the pandemic, we were very focused on listening intently to what our clients were saying was super important to them. And it really, it, it floats across the spectrum. You know, not all of our clients are protesting in the streets here in Portland, though some are. And, you know, it, we really see ourselves as the bridge between our clients and the vision they want for the future and then the global economy and the realities that we all face, you know, as we see these global imperatives really come to light. And so in 2020, here we are, you know, there's a pandemic and, you know, in past years, I think the environmental risks have been very apparent and, and very experienced by all of us. But now the notion that, you know, human value and human capacity has been called into question and is, is everyone's experience. The entire globe is recognizing, you know, what it means to breathe the same air and to really, you know, assess and reflect on human life. Um, you know, it's, it's very hard not to have part of, like much deeper conversations with clients. And so in 2020, you know, it's just uh, catalyzed those conversations and created a depth that I think has been welcomed by our team. Um, our clients feel like we have not only um, an open ear and an open heart, but we also have tools and solutions. Um, and we also are able to report on outcomes through our MSIQ reporting and everything else. So we feel really lucky to be equipped to be able to do this work um, in these important times and that clients are, are feeling really um, like our response is just what they need. So yeah, I would say if anything, we're experiencing growth. It's It's been exciting that um, all the seeds we planted all these years, knowing this is the right way to do business, um, are finally coming back and kind of flourishing um, to the point where we're hiring a new partner. Like it's it's been a wonderful response from our community 
And, um, and we're excited, even though there's lots going on in the world, we're, we're actually very optimistic about what this holds for our industry, our work and our future. Well, so I want to build on that and bring Lori in. So is what Noel's expressing, is that unique? Or are you guys experiencing a similar level of kind of awareness, interest and kind of um, value of your process uh, with your own client base at Veris? Sure, yeah, and just a little bit of background on Veris. Um, we're proud to be an independent RIA, so a little different um, than I know some others on the call may be part of a larger shop. Um, so we've been dedicated to impact wealth management. Um, we were founded in 2007 by pioneers in sustainable and impact investing. Um, so yeah, so while we've seen additional interest during this time, I think similarly there's been a buildup over the last five years or more. Um, certainly our firm has seen this tremendous growth along with the industry, so we're definitely fortunate for that. Um, and I think we are, you know, our clients are similarly very, you know, very interested to use their money for good. Um, we want, it's maybe if anything lit a sense of urgency for some of them or uh, made something more apparent than that was already there, always there. These social issues are not new. Um, you know, income inequality, racial disparities, all of those things I think our clients have, have been sometimes in some cases teaching us about these issues um, and the risks that were, you know, coming forward and, and it, the pandemic and, uh, you know, protests and all these issues have kind of raised light, um, shed light more on to these issues. So in some cases, you know, we're spending, we're doubling down on things like, you know, client conversations like education, helping them understand, you know, bridging that conversation between what is the, the social issue or the environmental issue and, and what's happening in their portfolio. So how are they actually having an impact um, and reminding them about the investments they already hold that are helping to help support the issue or introducing them to new investments that they may uh, not be aware of that could help them align their investments with their desire to help. Um, and we're also kind of going, um, facilitating their generosity in some cases, you know, helping them with cash flow, portfolio needs, um, helping them be more philanthropic or do more impact first portfolio investments. Um, and talking to them about what really matters. I think a lot of the, these rich conversations lately have been around their investment policy statements, the guidelines they want to use um, in, in how they value, you know, choose which investments are in their portfolios. And, you know, think foundations, for example, thinking about should we be spending more than 5% this year because of the need? And um, what, what are our impact priorities? And should that include a, you know, a greater emphasis on racial equity, for example? And so a lot of issues like that are coming up and it's been really interesting, really exciting to be able to be, try to be part of the solution with them. Well, so, so I wanna build on both of those. Yeah, I don't know what just happened there. Um, so <laughs> everybody's awake now. Um, so I wanna bring Brett in. Um, so we have these kind of interesting practices, right? But the work that you're doing, it's, it's essentially fulfilling that home office function where you're trying to support lots of advisors, right? And so how does this dynamic, what, you're, what we're hearing from Noel, what we're hearing from Lori, how's that playing out at a, at a higher level as you attempt to kind of help support all these advisors on meeting a lot of this uh, demand? Uh, well, thanks, Bella. It's, um, I think the points that Noel and Lori made are true across the board for the advisors that we're working with. In InvestNet, working with over 100,000 advisors, we see the full spectrum, not just of interest in impact and ESG and, and socially responsible investing, but also just sophistication in investing overall. Um, and what we've noticed is that over the past two, three, five months, um, in light of COVID and in light of the, the protests that are going on and you know, this awareness around racial injustice, there's just a tremendous momentum. Everybody all of a sudden wants to understand what's in their portfolio and they wanna understand it from the sense of, are these companies doing the right things right now? Are they protecting their employees? Are they protecting their consumers and their supply chains as it relates to COVID? And are they protecting their communities? And are they really empowering um, the diversity within their workforce and their supply chains, their consumers, uh, wh where it comes to the racial injustice. And it's not a, a one-off conversation. It's not, you know, like it used to be where an advisor would call up and say, hey, not really sure what solutions you have available. Um, talk to us about the various, you know, SRI stuff that you have. Uh, today, it is the home offices, the, the various enterprise firms that we work with that are calling and saying, listen, we recognize that this is the future of investing and we would like to know the full 
spectrum of options that you have available? How can we both educate our advisors and our investors, and how can we make sure that they have access to the, the full range of investments that you know really address all the various different nuances of their personal their values um, around around both of these issues and more? I, I think you know at this point the focus on environmentalism is getting a little bit lost, but that's still a crucial component. I noticed yesterday Morgan Stanley made an announcement that they were you know, going to start tracking their investment in fossil fuels. Um, and first big banks have declared that. So we're seeing not just the social and not just the COVID related, but also the full spectrum of environmental and social and governance priorities. Well, so so I want to I, I want to get to uh, a longer discussion about just how these types of investments generally are performing in the market. But before I get there, let's let's stay on this question about kind of client values and and these issues around inequality, wealth disparity, um, and the role of capital markets. So, Noel, let's let's come back to you. So, how are you helping clients really start to sort through these kinds of considerations and and then actually start to reflect a lot of that in the in the type of investment decisions they make? Sure. Um, I can tell you, I'm, I, my, my business is based in Hawaii, so they're experiencing, um, you know, kind of conflict and, and um, tension differently than here in Portland, Oregon, which is um, a little bit more intense in terms of what's been in the headlines recently. Um, so the way that I come to these client conversations is first with complete presence and an open ear. Um, one of my favorite teachers said to me, let's schedule, t let's schedule time so I can listen. He literally said, not so we can talk, but so I can listen. And that just signaled to me, yes, that's actually what my job is right now too. So when I'm reaching out to my clients, I said, look, we're going to have a conversation, but I mostly want to listen because everyone is experiencing this whole reflection around inequality and um, social justice and their role in it um, in different ways. And it's very complex. Um, I work hard as a part of my day to be um, on the front lines of that conversation. So I'm not only doing all the analysis and normal day-to-day -day wealth management work, but I stay very in tune with what kind of the social justice conversations are are taking place right now. One of my dearest friends works with immigrant families and helps them. Another friend's um, working with people who are homeless. And all of these conversations allow me to have a greater um, fluency in, in the various tenets of this conversation um, so that when I do approach my clients, I cannot be shocked. I can be literally responsive, um, receptive, and then take what I receive from them, look into our toolbox and understand of the strategies that we offer here at this firm and that are available universally, you know, what is going to be in the best interest of this client? You know, it's not a cookie cutter approach. It is literally like a bespoke custom design solution based on exactly what I just heard from the client of how they want their investments to be a reflection of, of what they're feeling in this moment. And not just right now, but again, we're making investments for the future. So we also talk about what does it look like to live in a world that celebrates diversity, that promotes equity, that defends equity. You know, how do we align ourselves and all the dollars that we have in our disposal, you know, in that beautiful vision. And so we also talk about how are you choosing to consume? How are you choosing and to give? You know, is there a greater give right now? Like Lori said, just doing that deep discovery gives us so much more content to be able to address that in their portfolio. And again, it's a, it's a constant process. And I love these conversations because I become one of the people that um, my clients want to stay connected with and constantly reflect on this. So I feel very um, heightened ESP with my clients right now, as everyone's experiencing this kind of wonderful reflection and awakening. And it's not all wonderful. Trust me, there's a lot of um, pain and, and collective trauma that we, we talk about on a regular basis. Um, but I, I, I say it's beautiful because I feel very honored to be a part of that. 
So. Well, so I think what you're highlighting for me, um, when we when we did the work with MMI, we really tried to say there are these steps in your advisory process around preparation, discovery, mm -hmm. recommendations, and management. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're drilling into, I, I want to get to the recommendations and the performance conversation, but let's stay on, Lori, I want to bring you in because I want to stay on this preparation and discovery. So how much is, when you guys think about how you prepare for client engagements generally, right, and how you conduct discovery, when you start bringing in this kind of increased focus on inequality and wealth disparity, how does that change your guys' process or does it at all? I mean, is it changing the kinds of questions you ask? Is it like Noel is trying to like, I'm now, you know, she's going to be informed on whatever the latest is on social justice generally, right? Because that she's going to drive that into her client conversation. So how is it starting to evolve maybe Varys' approach to kind of meeting client demand for this sort of thing? Yeah, thanks for the question. So I think for us, you know, we've relied on our research team who, uh, you know, they're able to go deep with all of the managers on our proof list and talk to them about how are they all responding during the COVID crisis. And so I think for us as wealth managers, we were able to kind of get that information all gathered together for us. And then that was kind of our research to be able to then communicate that to our clients. Like, you know, here's how this manager is approaching um, you know, the COVID crisis and how they're dealing operationally with their team. How are they also, how is the portfolio doing also in this moment, you know, with whatever was visible at the time. And, you know, these are ongoing uh, research and, and oversight uh, conversations. But I think just being transparent with clients, like in real time, kind of here's what we have, here's what we're, we're on the case uh, to find out. Uh, do you have any questions? And, uh, you know, I think there are, um, again, our clients are our best kind of you know, pusher to, to kind of continue to be authentic and, and to keep on the edge of, of what's really truly impact. And so I think that's been important for us. Um, I think leading also from our end, knowing what we know about the landscape and understanding um, where we think uh, folks are having a huge amount of impact. I think we've, we've kind of talked more about intentionally uh, things like CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, um, where, where you're really being able to fund uh, projects, affordable housing, uh, community facilities, et cetera, in these low-income communities that are being hardest hit right now. And so that's been um, an area of education that we're, if they haven't already done CDFIs, that's been one area where we've, we've started to have more intentional conversations. Well, so I, I want to bring Brett in because I think it raises an interesting dimension here. So it does every, I mean, because you're supporting 100,000 advisors, their clients are going to range, right? And I wonder, it's like when we start to have a conversation about CDFIs or we talk about, um, Noel raised this like, and we're, or Lori did too, about this, like using philanthropic capital as well and like kind of looking across it. But I mean, at the end of the day, how many of your advisors are really going to be able to direct clients in that direction, right? I mean, so there's that level of what's the customization that you can do? What are the minimums? Like all that kind of how does that playing into how you're starting to support? Because InvestNet plays in such a, a I think, a, a more pure like private or public market arena, right? We do. Um, and I think that that's where we, we've really excelled. But I think we have an opportunity as both a financial technology platform as well as an asset manager and an RIA to keep expanding what we're able to offer. We've worked, we've worked with Veris for, what is it, 10 years now, 11 years now, on building out our capabilities. And they've, um, they have continued to push us on what we're able to offer and how we think about structuring these various different offerings. I would imagine you hear a lot, uh, I mean, all the time now about democratization of impact. And 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it really was the purview of institutional investors, endowments, foundations, private foundations that were making the biggest change. Today, I think we've doubled the amount of retail investors who are accessing or, or using ESG or impact investments. And as we see new technologies like um, fractional share technology or new structures around private access vehicles, I, I can imagine there will be a day soon when we'd be able to access or offer access to uh, CDFIs or to you know, private notes or even private equity and venture capital around impact initiatives. Well, so, so Noah, I wanna bring you in because I, I wanna build on this a little bit just in terms of it's getting into this question of the recommendations, the options you can actually provide mm -hmm. clients. So let's, but let's start with the kind of million, million dollar question, trillion dollar question, whatever, but the, the performance of these kinds of investments in this current market, I mean, Presumably, the better the performance is going to, the easier the case you can make for providing certain kinds of strategies mm -hmm. to clients, to the range of clients. So talk to me a little bit about how that dynamic's playing out on your, on your end. 
Sure. I mean, I can't, given, you know, sure. certain, <laughs> yeah, I, I, can't, I can't talk um, specifics about <laughs> investments, but I can say that um, when we do the, the overall manager due diligence on our strategies, and we're not, we don't only limit our toolbox to those that integrate ESG and impact um, metrics. We, we're across the board. As a fiduciary, we believe it's imperative to look at all solution sets to make sure that our, because every, every client has different financial objectives and how they want to get there. So we are educated across the spectrum. Um, what I will say, though, is that it, there has been a demonstration in certain asset classes where you look across ESG and all traditional peers, and there's definite leadership, particularly in certain timeframes. And I would say that, um, you know, on a risk return basis, just depending on what the client needs, there have been standouts for us. So even a client that has um, articulated that, you know, when it comes to impact, you know, if, if, it's, if it's beating out the others, then I'll take it. Um, I can tell you that I would say of our client base of which we serve families, foundations, founders, and, you know, some surgeons, you know, we've got a, a really mixed group. Um, at least one of the strategies will have um, some level of ESG integration. And oftentimes it's not just the return, it's the risk that's driving that conversation. Um, we now have Aladdin embedded into our desktop, which allows us to really look granularly at the volatility of portfolios and at a security level um, standpoint. So with all these various tools, we're able to get very, very um, yeah, detailed about this custom design strategy for our clients. And it just, I mean, 2020 didn't just bring a pandemic, it also brought a shock in oil you know, and distribution, um, you know, disputes and just a fossil fuel free. I mean, it, it's pretty literal, you know, in terms of um, the risk standpoint, if you if you were out of the way of that big risk, you probably had a lot less risk in your portfolio and potentially, you know, had a better performance. So I'm going to let someone else who doesn't have, is that a independent speak <laughs> more broadly? Um, but I will say that across the board, um, the tide has, I mean, that myth of underperformance has been, you know, very easily demonstrated to our clients, particularly in certain asset classes and certain timeframes. And it's getting more and more where, you know, now we've got so much more data in terms of, you know, we've been waiting for at least three year track records for some of these new investments coming out and here we are. And so the toolkit keeps getting bigger and we keep telling our clients and to Brett's point about democratization, you know, our clients who are starting out, you know, saving a lot, but not with a, a great amount of assets yet, like that toolkit is getting bigger every day. It's just that we want to do our due diligence and make sure that the academic kind of approach to portfolio construction is not being thrown out, that we're utilizing that in conjunction with all of the various um, new tools available and then combining them in ways that we can bring down the minimum so that more people can access you know, this type, we, we got to be a hybrid before we go full electric, you know, it's a, it's a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So we're starting out with the used Prius, not the Tesla. Is that, is that the, that's the go. one, that's the yeah. one. Um, <laughs> all right. So I want to, I want to um, switch up the order here. I want to bring Brett in. So talk to us a little bit about some of these more kind of the macro uh, indicators of performance that you guys are seeing. Yeah, definitely. So we did a, a study recognizing about halfway through, well, I wish it was halfway through this, uh, the, the COVID um, pandemic, uh, but a couple of months in, at the end of April, we started looking at performance and we started to recognize that uh, the, the funds that really were oriented around ESG is specifically were starting to outperform. And this matched with research we'd seen from uh, Morgan Stanley, from Morningstar, from BlackRock. So we looked at all the, the strategies that were available on our platform and we looked at year-to-date numbers through the end of April, um, U.S. equity, international equity, and fixed income, the three big asset classes that we cover, all three outperformed their peers by over 100 basis points, uh, fixed income by over 250 basis points. And then we looked at one-year performance. So going back to uh, May 1st of last year to see, okay, this is great that ESG holds up during a pandemic, during protests. Um, what does it look like over a longer term? 
we found that the, the outperformance was almost double what it was over the first four months of this year. So about 300 basis points outperformance in U.S. equity, about 200 in international, and 350 basis points in fixed income. So was, I think for investors and advisors, it was just this wake-up call that ESG is not just good during downturns. Um, it really does provide resilience and outperformance and downside protection over the course of, of a really volatile market cycle. And I think that matches what we saw from BlackRock. They said something like 94% of their ESG portfolios were in the top 50% of their peer group. Um, that's almost unheard of for, for one specific investment philosophy to be so highly concentrated in the top 50% of a peer group. I think Morningstar found similar data. You know, you can look at the, the data that John Hale puts out. Um, it's pretty telling. Yeah. Well, and, and Lori, as, as one of the shops that's been probably doing this uh, longer than most, I mean, is this, are you, is this all getting reflected in your own book of business? Yeah, I think that, you know, for the clients, you know, I think part of our job is to educate about performance too. So, um, you know, as we're doing the discovery process and we're applying certain screens to the portfolio, at that point, we want to tell them, here's how these screens are going to likely impact portfolio. So if you're not going to be in fossil fuel free, you know, if you're in a fossil fuel free portfolio, if oil goes up, if the energy sector goes up, you will probably underperform, right? So it's kind of having that upfront conversation. And then uh, conversely, the, the, you know, what happened uh, year to day with energy really being the worst performing sector uh, in the US, we're, we're seeing the benefits of, of them not being in that sector. And so for them kind of, you know, the, it's nice to get that validation that their value by being values aligned, they didn't have to suffer, you know, under performance. Um, so, so that's been good, but I think it's always kind of a conversation. We can't always bank on, you know, that time frame. you know, as Noel mentioned, you know, it does depend on the time frame. It depends on what we're holding. I mean, those, you know, a lot of ESG portfolios are also high in technology as well. And that has, outperformed and so if they had a higher growth allocation you know which means mostly technology uh, then they likely outperformed as well so we're, we're careful about the conversation about performance we know that's a sticky one um, but we do like to have a lot of education around that and try to show data um, as was also mentioned around here's you know estimated tracking error or the difference you know versus the benchmark that we think you, you know your screens will um, create and just talk to them about you know over the long term this is what you can expect so yeah, just as long as we have that transparency, we think that um, you know the, the client is is in a good spot. So I so uh, I want to. There's a couple other questions I want to get to, and I definitely want to open it up to the audience to start throwing questions out there. So please start putting them through um, in the chat box. Um, but I think we we definitely can't turn it over to everybody until we do the million dollar question around how and to what extent are you, do you guys think that the DOL guidance that came out around consideration of ESG for institutional, how is that, how will that play out? How will that trickle down? What are you, what are you feeling right now um, in terms of market reaction? So um, Noel, you were the first one to unmute your thing. So let's, let's, let's jump on in. Yeah. Um, I, uh, anytime there's some kind of like regulatory response, <laughs> I always see it as an opportunity to have a deeper conversation. I actually think that if um, ESG is, is coming into, you know, the, the periphery of our regulatory agencies and also to, it just makes it so that all of these foundations have to really understand it. I see it as a good thing. You know, we've been talking about what it means to be a fiduciary for a while with our foundations. I think, mean, you know, one of our foundations will tell you, we've been talking about five years ago and they're not even focused on like traditional causes, like environmental, they're, they're literally like an arts institution. Um, and we still were, we're talking through, what does it mean with MIFA and other, you know, policies in place to define, you know, using all the information available to have the context to make informed decisions on behalf of an organization, right? So it's to me um, just allowing us to go deeper and make sure everyone in that boardroom um, has consensus around the conversation. Um, and it's prompted just wonderful conversation um, that I, uh, we encourage, so. So you you turned a, a potential negative into a positive. So this is real. This is a real opportunity for for deeper discussion. Okay, uh, Brett, <laughs> what are what okay, are you looking uh, at at the at the macro level? 
at the macro level, we're just looking at the we're looking at the number of asset managers who, on a very serious level, have started to integrate ESG into their portfolios. And we take this perspective that listen, you go to a doctor and they're the expert on what's going wrong with your body. We go to the asset managers, we look at them, and they're the expert on the investment management industry. They live and die by the performance and success of their portfolios. And so if these big asset managers, uh, Vanguard was uh, mentioned today as finally turning around and, and acknowledging the importance of ESG, but BlackRock, Vanguard, Federated, uh, PIMCO, all these legacy, long-standing trillion dollar asset managers are hiring entire ESG teams. And they are turning their portfolios into ESG portfolios and building new ones. And if they are the ones who are jumping on board, I'm not really sure why it's in the DOL's purview to say, we need to control this. We need to regulate it. Now, I do think some clarity is really good around ERISA guidance. Um, and that's what the DOL is for. But I really think that they should take the lead from the experts in the field who are those asset managers. And, and I mean, Lori, to bring you in, are you servicing clients that have expressed any concern? I mean, is this something that even gets onto the client's radar or is this really something that's more for all of us to be staying up at night worrying about? Yeah, I mean, we don't actually have a lot of uh, you know, impacted clients. However, uh, we do focus mostly on individuals and their private foundations. But um, I would say we are engaging them and coming to them with the issues. So we just sent an email to, the, to clients yesterday saying, you know, your action is needed by July 30th. There's this very short window for a comment period. And we're actually engaging them to send letters to the DOL and also to write letters to their Congress people. So uh, we're, we're definitely educating them about the issue and, and just, you know, how important it is. Yeah, and I would encourage folks to check out, there was a, a, a letter that was put together by a guy named John Lacomic of Sinclair Capital, who's kind of a, been a field builder leader in the space for a while, and we signed on to it, a number did. It's one of the most methodical and persuasive uh, arguments for <laughs> clarified guidance that uh, we ever did see. So um, encourage you guys to check out John Lacomic's stuff. So um, I want to do one more question, and then I definitely want to get to audience Q&A. So, uh, to the point, Brett uh, made the comment, we're hopefully we'll be midway through the pandemic, but we are definitely midway through 2020. Um, so what do you see, what do you anticipate on the horizon for the back half of the year? And how are you communicating this view to your clients? So uh, Lori, we're going to start with you this time. All right. Um, sure. Well, I think, you know, it's no surprise. I mean, we all don't have a crystal ball, so I think it's, it's a you little don't? bit of a <laughs> Yeah. Oh man! Uh. <laughs> if, if anything, uh, we have learned, you know, we, we definitely can't project what's going to happen. Um, but uh, certainly, we're talking about expected further volatility, and we're using this moment as like, hey, if we weren't exactly at the asset allocation or cash flow uh, amount that we we should have been at, we, we are going to get there right now. It is a perfect time. We have almost recovered uh, all the losses. Um, and then for, you know, I think just leading up to the election, it'll be hard to, to not see a lot of volatility. Um, and so we're you know, letting clients know. I think for our clients, they uh, are interested in, let's say, change. Um, and, uh, you know, but if we do see a change in the federal government, we will likely see some, you know, downside volatility in the stock market. Of likely, you know, higher taxes, regulation, and in all expectations, likelihood of it happening overnight, of course, not, not likely at all. But, um, you know, just there's a, there's a lot of bills we have to pay as a government in terms of all the monetary stimuli we're, you know, we're putting out there, benefits, infrastructure investments, of course. So, um, you know, the money does have to come from somewhere. So, you know, our, our clients are supportive of that. Um, but I, you know, it's about education and just, you know, giving out, laying out the concerns and, and making sure that we're in the right asset allocation uh, for, the, for the short and long term. So I want to. So there's we, we've got a couple of really good questions coming in, in particular from Paul Ellis and Steve Godeke. So uh, I want to give Noel and Brett a chance to reflect on kind of what do you see as the kind of big priorities coming up over the back half of the year, and then we'll get into those. So Noel, sure. So Morgan Stanley's been somewhat out of consensus that um, we're going to be full steam ahead, kind of in a V-shaped recovery with a few start and stops here. Um, our team is a little more cautiously optimistic, but I think what gives us the greatest sense of hope is knowing that um, all this reflection on this time of, of understanding human value and human capacity, we think will reshape the way that work 
you know, is, is defined, in, not just over the back half of this year, but if, if we do see a change in this kind of work from home environment and people are going, how did my enterprise, you know, actually support me during this time. I had a friend who's an RIA who said he's going to be hiring tutors for his team so that they can focus and their kids can be educated. And I just think, you know, more of that processing of thinking through what are the needs of my organization, not just the organization, but the people within it. Um, I think there's going to be a very interesting um, kind of shuffling of talent. And I think it behooves and, and you'll see this already, right, in, in kind of corporate messaging, a demonstration of values. Um, and I think we're going to see more of it. So I actually think it's very exciting because if you look at the demographics and you see who's in the highest earning years right now, who's popping out babies. Now, I'm an elder millennial and I have a lot of friends who are in IVF right now because they literally want to have families. This is the next youth boom. And it's, to me, a very exciting um, kind of demographic shift that's going to change the way that um, work is experienced in this country. I think those who get it right are going to attract, retain, and just nurture and, and do a really good job with their talent. And those who kind of are tone deaf to this shift, unfortunately, are going to kind of fall by the wayside. So, you know, this ESG integration really does lend itself, you know, with the S factor to say if, if human capacity, whether with productivity plus innovation, then leads to profitability, potentially, um, we see that with tech, right, definitely, then if not just tech companies, but there's a big kind of um, understanding across the board and CEOs thinking in this way, then that's a very exciting, um, you know, kind of trend that we're looking at. So, you know, in the back half of 2020 and beyond. Brett, anything you want to add on that? I'll keep it really short because I'm looking at the questions and there's some great ones. There's, there's some great ones, um, yeah. Yeah, so to Lori's point, we don't have a crystal ball, but also to Noel's point, companies that are positioning themselves or have already positioned themselves to really be advocates for their employees, for their consumers, for their communities, they're the ones that are going to continue to outperform. And because there's such a high correlation between that and ESG and that and impact investing, I think, you know, this ESG... We used to say five years from now, ESG is going to be table stakes. It's going to be sooner than that. It'll be 18 months from now when every single asset manager is looking at ESG, when every single company is reporting on their ESG metrics, at least the, the publicly traded ones. I, I can't see it any other way. Okay. So with that, I want to bring in some of these really great questions. So let's start with Paul Ellis raised a question around, please talk about cost of capital for ESG integration strategies versus peer group across asset classes. A very good consideration. So uh, I open it up to um, any of you guys who wants to join in first. I'm seeing no unmuting of their, of their, let's do Brett, let's go for it. I'm happy to go first. Okay, because I think it talks to another question that got asked on here, which was um, you know, the, how, the effect of the portfolio holdings impacting society and environment, right? And I think if you're looking at a company's cost of capital, the ones where there's uh, momentum of investment into a corporation, you're gonna see lower cost of capital. And the one where there's divestment from that company, you're gonna see increased cost of capital. And as it becomes more expensive for a company to borrow and to expand their operations, fund R&D, um, to me, it's more than just a signaling mechanism, which is what divestment always used to be uh, held out as, especially in the public markets, right? It's now we're actually affecting how effective a company can be with their cost of capital by investing or divesting from them. And I think that has direct impact on what their business model is and how they impact both society and environment. Anybody want to add anything else? No yeah, I guess, you know, it's the same mantra we, we tell our clients, which is that you are voting with your dollars, you know? And so that's, that's the most literal, um, you know, cost of capital is, is like a most literal way that we can demonstrate that. But I, I, I love this idea and I love the way Brett explained it because ultimately that is the democratization, right? So capital markets are affecting change like very quickly um, because people are kind of awakening to the fact that they can pull that lever and not just the biggest institutions, not just the biggest families who who've led the charge and pioneered in many ways and thankful for them um, and all the research that they've provided to help others, you know, follow in suit. Um, but it's, it's, 
it's literal, you know, it's vote with your dollars. And um, I'm just excited as Brett and Lori are that this is going to become not just something for a few, it's going to be like, like Brett said, table stakes is going to be like a mass. We're going to drop the impact part. It'll just be investing. So I will jump to the next question and maybe I'll, I'll bring it to Lori first. So first, thanks to Paul for that question. He has an amazing podcast on Bright Talk. I suggest everybody check it out. He's not paying me to say that. It's just really good. Um, all right. So Steve Godeke, I'm going to bring in his question next. So Steve literally just wrote the handbook on impact investing. So um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, and, and it gets to one of the points that I think both Lori and Noel were raising about kind of looking at the full, the full toolkit that you can kind of deploy for your clients. And his question goes, what specific impact investing opportunities do you provide clients beyond portfolio construction? Things like shareholder engagement, policy, place-based investing. Um, and so Lori, let's start off with you. Sure, yes, absolutely. Um, our clients are, are, you know, in some cases activists themselves. And so being a shareholder activist to them is, is uh, something that they welcome. And so. Um, depending on the manager that we're working with, they can have a more direct engagement re relationship or a more indirect relationship. But um, in one case, at least, you know, we're able to partner with a nonprofit organization along with the, the asset manager to do direct engagement opportunities where they can sign on. They're part of the, the resolution. Uh, their name is listed. Um, and, and they're able to kind of be part of the, the, the action and the movement and, and keep track of how that issue is um, resolved or with, withdrawn uh, from the company over time, you know, if it's successful or voted on. Um, so shareholder engagement, definitely a big one. We also report on kind of how the funds that are more kind of indirectly doing shareholder engagement on their behalf, um, what, what wins they're having, what progress they're making. Um, in terms of policy, we talked about um, how we're engaging our clients in uh, the letter writing and comment period of the DOL. Um, Place-based strategies, yeah, so we're talking to them uh, about that depending on their client preferences. So for some, you know, it is, a, a, again, a conversation about CDFIs, about how, um, you know, their local, you know, CDFI might be, you know, an opportunity for them, or in certain cases, um, yeah, considering other place-based, you know, initiatives that they can support philanthropically or um, through movements. I know some some funds allow you to, to target geographically. I may not be a CDFI specifically, but there are some some options there as well. Noel, talk to us about the toolkit you guys are working with. Sure. So we're really lucky that our team in New York developed um, and in London this this wonderful report called the MSIQ or the Morgan Stanley Impact Quotient. And it's a, it's a report that basically is, you know, it's a, at first we fill out this, this pretty extensive questionnaire, and then we can actually overlay with our clients, like how aligned is your portfolio to the values that you've articulated and go line by line through the various strategies at a security level and, and understand what of your strategies are very activated and which are not. And so we have all these different ways to kind of paint the picture of the level of intentionality with the portfolio. And again, it just, it prompts the conversation with clients because sometimes out of that reporting, we get a feel from them. For example, I have a, a client who said like, actually this one manager is a little too activist for me. I, I actually like to be a little more passive. I like to vote with my dollars, but I don't necessarily want to take, you know, an active shareholder to try to, to then um, influence, you know, I'd rather just kind of, you know, walk than, than be active. And so um, it really just depends on the client. And it also requires us, as Lori does, um, to really know our, our asset managers, to understand the different flavors um, of the way that what they operate, the way they think about systemic change and kind of the leverage they're pulling um, during their conversations with these um, investments into companies. And then for us to reflect on those as we're talking to our clients. So that's kind of the approach we've taken. And Brett, I mean, how does your toolkit compare to what Noel is able to deploy versus what Lori is able to deploy um, in your world? I think our toolkit is, uh, again, because we're an investment platform, we're um, much more focused on the public investment side. So we don't have the same tools that a RIA would have in terms of private investments yet um, or access to CDFIs. But I think what we bring to the table is the ability to do some pretty comprehensive reporting. Uh, what we're working on now is some pretty um, interesting uh, assessment tools, you know, being able to identify not just if a client is interested in impact investing, but what type of impact are they looking to achieve? 
um, and doing it through some really interesting behavioral modeling. So we, we focus more on the providing of the investment strategies and the tools and the technology uh, to the advisors to be able to, to work directly with their clients on it. Well, so thank you to, yep, go ahead, Lori. One thing to add, because um, um, Brett mentioned, you know, various works with, with uh, investment, but yeah, we've, I think, you know, investment's done a great job of thematic strategies as well. So helping, um, you know, not just take, you know, here's a portfolio, but how do you, you know, kind of thematically, you know, let's say for gender lens, for example, there's a strategy around that, you know, there are different ways to, to achieve these different impacts. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So, uh, well, thanks to Steve that his new handbook with uh, Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, you can go on his website or their website and get it. Um, so I want to do one more question and then I want to tee you guys up to kind of give that. It, they used to do this at CGI where it's like, what's the action item? What are you going to, what are people going to be able to apply to their practice tomorrow? So, but first I want to get to a question from Adam Jones. So it goes, I assume, but with a likely global reception, reception, uh, recession, do your panelists believe they will only focus on companies already in their portfolios? If they're willing to invest in a new company, what stage or level of traction will be necessary for the next 12 months? It's an interesting question. Um, open it up to you guys to uh, Noel. Sure. I was just on a conversation with um, some elite practitioners, a, a national group called the Investment and Wealth Institute, of which, full disclosure, I'm on the board. And we were talking about, you know, how companies or asset managers, you know, all of this, how us as an organization are going to show up in this moment. And I think the question posed is like, is there anyone who's not on your radar that will be on your radar and why? And I think, I think the bottom line for us is that you don't have to have all the answers, right? In this moment, none of us do, right? I think we're the, the moving target of what it means to be ethical, let alone, you know, morally, you know, above others or whatever. It's a, it's a moving target daily. And, you know, this pandemic, this social unrest, just the way that our world is kind of shaping up is causing all of us to really grapple personally and then on a greater level with how we are going to make sense of it all. And I think what would make the difference for me and for a lot of the asset managers we work with that are implementing the funds for, for our clients um, and for Morgan Stanley's MS and Co and, and all the research we do is what's the intention, right? So there is an article about virtue signaling recently that came out, like if corporations are flying a banner, but do they really mean it, right? And so I think what's important for us is to understand, you know, you want to partner with me now on this, but will you still be partnering with us on this five years from now? Or are you, are you going to be just checking a box because that's what all the other corporations are doing or whatever else? And I think we really rely on um, the deep research of some of our asset managers who've been thinking through this like as pioneers for a really long time um, to, to get to that level of depth and intentionality and commitment. And so um, that's, that's my answer is like, is it just a flash in the pan or is it definitely like we're thinking these things through, we don't have all the answers, but here's how we're already taking steps. Here's where we're getting the resources and just having a very meaningful response, not a reaction. Lori? Yeah, no, I love those comments. Um, I think also, you know, similarly, we do rely on, on mostly private fund managers, let's say, uh, to, to make the calls on, on which individual companies are, are going to be interesting and, and profitable in the future with a sustainability element to it. Um, I will say though, uh, you know, if this is truly an early stage company that is coming off the ground, I, I feel like there are more accelerators right now and more people thinking about small businesses in general right now that there could be some philanthropic capital, there could be, there are more resources, I think, for small businesses and entrepreneurs to kind of get through the next 18 months. But um, that's sort of an anecdotal punch that I've heard. Okay. So before I, I bring it, bring it to the, bring it to the close, Brett, anything you'd want to add on that? Yeah, I just think that there's a, um, there's a, there's room in a portfolio to the extent that the investor can access things like private investments. There's room for all stages of companies. Uh, it should have both private and public within the private side, there's room for venture capital and then more mature private equity. I think the impact of each of these investments is different. 
venture capital is often more, um, there's often just one specific intention. It's a company that's trying to eliminate waste from the ocean or trying to create socks out of recycled water bottles. And I think that those types of investments are really um, direct impact. And that feeds up into the private equity side where there's a little bit more of a diversified portfolio. And then on the public equity side or public debt side, where you're really using your dollars to vote. Um, on big corporate entities, multinational engagements, and thinking about how does that signal to the market the importance of various initiatives, or you know how does that lower or raise the cost of capital? So I think there's room in a portfolio for for all of those, and I hope that one day that every investor has access to that full spectrum of of company size. So, uh, Adam Jones, I don't know if you have a, a great podcast like Paul Ellis or a great book like Steve Godeke, but whatever you do, I hope people check yourself out because that was a great question. So we're in the home stretch and I want to give uh, each of our panelists a chance to kind of leave you with that action item. And it can be what your firm is doing that's going to be providing more support to advisors going forward, generally at an industry level. It could also be just what are you guys going to be doing that you're most excited about um, over the next, you know, six to 12 months. So uh, let's start with Brett. You've not gone first on any of these. So we'll give you first uh, dibs on this. Good. Okay. Well, I have two quick answers. One, know what's in your portfolio. There's so many free tools out there right now. Um, Yahoo Finance, you can check out the ESG scoring of any individual security for free. Uh, there's As You So has a tool called Invest Your Values, where all the mutual funds that you ha have, you can look at things like ownership of fossil fuels or gun manufacturers. Just know what's in your portfolio. Be really clear about what you have. What we're most excited about is really helping advisors identify investors who would be interested in impact investing, but either don't know that it exists don't know that they have the access or capability to, to use it um, or to engage with it, uh, or, or just helping advisors become more clear on what that intention that their investor has. Great. Noel? Wonderful answer. I'm not going to repeat it, even though I, I <laughs> wanted to. Um, I guess I would offer something different, which is that I think that um, we have to recognize that as professionals, like we're affected. Um, of course, I'm in Portland, so I'm very much feeling um, all of the um, all of the energy that's in the air right now. And I think it, it's on us to work harder to actually drill down and do the personal work to keep peace and keep our ears wide open, because I think that is going to be where we create this greatest connection with our clients is to be able to truly listen to that small voice that's calling for I want to try something different, something doesn't feel right. And then being able to have the space and, and calm within us to go in and say, let's talk more about that. And do you realize that we could, we could create a solution around that? And then it feels very generative and curing, you know, in the process of, of working together. So my, you know, small invitation, um, cause Brad already took one of mine, um, was, would be that, you know, don't be afraid to, to do the internal work and, and keep the peace and keep ears wide open. Awesome. Lori. Yeah, no, I mean, I guess for those that are, are newer or even just in the, in the industry for a while, just wanting to stay connected, I would just maybe recommend there are lots of communities of impact investing, uh, you know, professionals out there. Um, I happen to co-found one for, for those who identify as women, uh, Women Investing for a Sustainable Economy or WISE. Uh, you can look it up, wisecommunity.org. But um, that's just one community. You assist is, uh, you know, another one. Uh, there's a new uh, racial, racial justice investing coalition. You can look that up also if that's a topic of interest for you. Um, so just, you know, keep looking out. Extend, you know, I think this is a great community started here at Total Impact um, and just continue to keep the conversations going. I think we'll all be able to help each other that way. Yeah, I see our next report uh, in September. And it's really about how do you start to make the transition from a focus on impact or ESG at a portfolio level to really start to integrate a more systemic perspective, particularly for issues around um, societal systemic risk. Uh, so that will come out in September. That'll be our next thing. So without further ado, thank you to the amazing panelists and for Adam and Paul and Steve and everyone else who submitted really good questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to get to all of them, but uh, we were for sure happy to follow up individually. Um, but I will pause here and I will throw it back to Alex to take us home. Bill, thank you so much for 
for taking the time to moderate the panel and, and Laurie and Brett and Noel, thank you all for, for lending your, your expertise. Um, and, uh, and thank you all for, for attending.